Welcome to the Debate at Geo8 podcast series. Today we'll be talking to a national security expert, Vice Admiral Paul Madison, who is the director of the UNSW Defence Research Centre. The centre aims to strengthen UNSW's position as the nation's leading defence university and to play a defining role in accelerating the delivery of capability for the Australian Defence Force. Paul is a graduate of Canada's Royal Military College and served in the Canadian Armed Forces for more than 30 years. He commanded at all levels, both at sea and on land, and retired in 2013 from his appointment as Commander of the Royal Canadian Navy. Paul returned to public service two years later as High Commissioner of Canada to Australia, a position he held for four years during which time he did his utmost to strengthen bilateral ties between his newly adopted country Australia and Canada. Hello, my name's Ron Candelars. I'm a freelance journalist and producer, and throughout this series we've been canvassing a range of topics, touching upon the work of all the Group of Eight universities. They include the Australian National University, Monash University, UNSW Sydney, the Universities of Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, Queensland and Western Australia. Also in the studio with me is Vicky Thompson, the CEO of the Group of Eight Universities. Well, firstly, Vice Admiral Paul Madison, tell us about your role as Director of the UNSW Defence Research Centre. It's a role spread over uh, two campuses, I understand, Sydney and Canberra? Yeah, that's correct, uh, Ron. So UNSW has always been a defence research intensive university. Uh, we're the only university that has a faculty that's co-located with a, an ADF base, that being the Australian Defence Force Academy. But the senior leadership a few years ago, I think it's reacting to the signals in the 2016 defense white paper, I uh, decided that there needed to be a greater focus on um, defense research uh, at UNSW. And so my role really is to bring that defense research value proposition more clearly into the faculties, into the schools, into the labs uh, for researchers to see their own success reflected and pivoting towards solving complex defense problems uh, in the national interest. And conversely, um, I my team and I spend a lot of time uh, with defense, uh, with the ADF, with the capability managers uh, at all levels, uh, ranks, uh, senior defense civilians, as well as uh, defense industry, other universities, international partners, just bringing that greater view for them of what it is uh, that UNSW can do. I like to say that uh, defense, in defense, you will find reflected uh, every aspect of the human condition. It's not just about uh, higher end warfare. It's about how do you how do you attract, how do you sustain, how do you motivate, how do you lead across that spectrum of operations. And so it touches on every faculty, not just engineering and science, but medicine, law, art design and architecture, business. And so um, that's my role really to be that uh, matchmaker, to be that bridge. Could you give me an example of the way in which you resolve some of these problems that are that are seen in the defence force and you know cross faculties and universities? Some folks in defence might be looking to understand better uh, how to attract uh, folks into their organisation. You know what what is it that is incentivizing uh, young people to pivot towards service? And so um, our faculty of business would have. Uh, expertise there. Or there might be a need for artificial intelligence and, and autonomy in uncrewed maritime vessels. And so working with Navy and working with the Defense Science and Technology Group, we have researchers who are expert at that. And so, you know, we 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 bring our researchers in to kind of focus on solving these problems, working with defense, working with industry, working with other universities, working with international partners. And you know, our view is that we live in a really interesting time um, where it's actually a strategic imperative. Uh, we saw this in the Defense Strategic Review. We've seen it in some of the defense, uh, sorry, the budget statements from the PM, from the Treasurer, from uh, MINDEF, from MINDI. There's a strategic imperative in this decade to bring all instruments of national power to bear on strengthening Australia's national security, uh, which is really the underpinning of our our values and our way of life. So there's a role here, a big role for universities to play in that national endeavour. Can I just pick up on a couple of those points you've made, Paul? As you're aware, I've recently returned from the US, a trip that 
you helped uh, provide advice to in terms of who I should and shouldn't meet and all those sorts of things. And one of the things that really struck me in meeting with our university counterparts from uh, the US and the UK in particular in the AUKUS context, but also more broadly, we had representatives from Japan, from Europe and from Canada, is that AUKUS for Australia and for universities in particular is incredibly important and and ever-present. And certainly from the Group of Eight's perspective, where we do the lion's share of defence research, um, we are all leaning into this in a big way. And we can't do it on our own, right? AUKUS Pillar 2 mm-hmm. is all about a science and technology agreement. It's not necessarily all the focus is on the actual kit, but AUKUS Pillar 2 will sort of underpin that. And so I was very surprised, although you had forewarned me that this may be the case, and I've since been picking that intelligence up from others, that I sort of got a, nah, it's a you know, it was a one-day news story, we've got other things, and part of it is because the US has this incredible defence ecosystem already, so that's slightly different structures. I think the UK are just in such an economic basket case land that they're kind of not focused mm. on it. But I do think that there seems to be a bit of work back the back end that we have to do and people like yourselves have to do to actually get that understanding about what AUKUS Pillar 2 is and that broad understanding, as you've just articulated, around where does research go across the domains. And so I'd be interested in your observations about that and also how do we do that because I, I find in many ways I guess I was starting down the end here, and I've realised we've got to come back here and actually bring people on the journey with us. Yeah, we, we have to sort of stand in Canberra and then stand in Washington and then stand in, in, in London and kind of look out around the town and get a sense for w- what are the real strategic priorities. And obviously there are, when it comes to free democracies working together to defend the rules-based order as we know it, then there's a huge point of intersection there. But you know, there are other forces at play. Obviously, we have, you know, differing histories, differing sort of cultural narratives at play. The, the, the politics are, are different, and and so we just have to be aware of all of that. For Australia, and you know, we're geographically we're we're here in the Indo Pacific. We look up and from the Northeast Indian Ocean across South uh, West Southeast Asia into the South Pacific, and with China. Um, up north. I mean, we see how important the next few years are to ensuring that the prosperity that we enjoy in terms of a, a medium sized, resource rich maritime trading nation that, that we have to really be paying attention. Now, in Washington, there are folks like Kurt Campbell, for example. I don't know if you met him, but I think he's the senior advisor to the president on into Pacific sort of strategic issues, uh, his office would be, you know, laser focused on the Indo-Pacific and, and and the relationship with Australia around AUKUS would be very important. But, you know, the U.S. also has bandwidth that has to go to what's happening in, in the Russo-Ukrainian war, which is, of course, a huge issue. What's happening in the Middle East, uh, what's happening in Africa, what's happening in Latin America. So, so, so there's, and what's happening sort of politically, domestically in the U.S. So, yes, you'll sometimes get the impression that there's folks who aren't waking up and picking August in their first, uh, with their first coffee in Washington um, and in London uh, to the same degree we are here in Australia. But I don't think that actually takes away the importance of the agreement. Mm. The I don't think it takes away the importance. Yeah. I agree with you it doesn't take away the importance, but I yeah. think it makes the challenge somewhat harder. And there's a really good yeah. example of research collaboration underway between UNSW, King's College and Arizona State Universities. So those three universities have got together and formed the PLUS Alliance, and, of course, you can talk to that, Paul. But I think at that level there's no doubt that is happening. I have no doubt that you, institutions are doing that. But at that sort of more macro policy level, what concerns me, I guess, is at the you know our universities at that level are probably not thinking about some of the barriers to that engagement there are policy barriers you know we've got to navigate security systems visas. and regulatory arrangements and visas exactly so if i look at the role that the group of eight can play with 
our counterparts in the UK, which is the Russell Group, the American Association of Universities in in the US. Um, that's where I think there's a bit of a journey yet to still to st- and and in fact, because I'm always positive, that's an opportunity for us, right? As as opposed to the challenges there. So how do we overcome that? And it's people like Paul that we really are going to be relying on to help us navigate those paths. Universities are sometimes forgotten in, in, in that sort of strategic overlay where you know policymakers, government, departments of defense, and industry are sort of coming together naturally to figure out how to accelerate around knowledge exchange for for, for defense. So you know new disruptive capabilities rapidly moved up the TRL line into prototyping and scaled up into sovereign manufacture. Um, we're talking interchangeability now amongst defense forces as opposed to interoperability. So uh, a future coalition force, all domain, so sea, land, air, cyber, space, where everybody's comfortable uh, with the, the the systems and and uh, and working together. But universities are are huge engines of of knowledge creation, and and so if you listen to the language coming out of governments. You know, the strategic warning time is gone. We, we can't really predict exactly where the Chinese Communist Party, for example, is going in this decade, but we know that it's uh, generating a great deal of uh, strategic uncertainty and um, anxiety around being prepared to protect economic and sort of value streams. And, and so if we're going to accelerate, it's not just government and industry working together. Universities must come to the dance and 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 pitch ourselves as a key catalyzer um, and and make it clear that universities are committed to the democratic values upon which they stand, and that we have researchers and laboratories and teams generating world leading globally impacting knowledge that can be applied with industry to generate and sustain that competitive advantage for the uh, defense operator, whether it's ADF, whether it's the United States, whether it's the UK, other allies like Canada, Japan. I mean, that's really what we need to be doing together in order to strengthen deterrence, in, in order to avoid a large regional conflict, which would be so potentially catastrophic in its disruption in terms of economic prosperity and our way of life. So that, that's, I think, is a, a key role for the Group of Eight is to be in that conversation with your colleagues in America and the UK and elsewhere and, and a reassuring government uh, that we're there as, as instruments of national power to lean into the national interest. Paul, a uh, uh... I'd like to drill down into, you know, your history leading up to this job with a group of eight university, because I think it gives our audience an understanding of the the, the knowledge that you bring to this. Thirty odd years, thirty seven years uh, uh, in the Canadian Armed Forces, both on land and sea, commander of the Royal Canadian Army, uh, Navy, sorry, uh, and you've served as a High Commissioner here in Australia. So you have these amazing uh, career experiences over your journey. Uh, tell us a bit about that, and also, can you tell us from what you've seen uh, with your relationship uh, with Australians here? Do we have the capacity to develop um, AUKUS Pillar Two? Do we have the capacity to, you know, implement uh, the the recommendations of the Strategic Review announced more recently? Look, I I, I grew up through the Canadian Navy, and so uh, was first exposed to. The Australian Navy about 40 years ago. So we quickly discovered that we were like-minded, that we had the same sort of levels of professionalism. Uh, we were sailing in the same waters, whether it was Gulf War One, Gulf War Two, RIMPAC exercises, uh, port visits to you know Tokyo and Singapore and that kind of thing. So, you know, the Canadian Navy and the Australian Navy always look at each other as as very close sort of strategic cousins. And so, so that there's always that kind of respect there. When I came here as High Commissioner in 2015, uh, again, I was uh, operating on that assumption that we were very, very like-minded, but um, I began to quickly to diverge from that. The more and more I learned about Australians and Australia, 
even though my wife of you know 35 years had uh, explained a lot to me uh, <laughs> about Australia over the years as we were reading Snuggle Pot and Cuddle Pie to our kids growing up in the cold, <laughs> cold Canadian winters, but yeah. that's another story. We're a, me- a weird but, mob, as they say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, one of the first book, one of the first books I read when I came here was recommended to me was Fear of Abandonment by uh, the recently uh, departed uh, Alan Gingell, mm-hmm. a phenomenal mm-hmm. uh, man, a great, great public servant here in Australia, and I began to understand more about the geog- how why geography matters why the relationships with great powers whether it was great britain or the united states were absolutely pivotal to securing australia australia's interests in this region and i became much more appreciative of australia's appetite for strategic risk there's you know going after nuclear submarines um, going after um, august pillar 2 Developing a guided weapons uh, and explosive ordnance uh, industry, taking on a, a very ambitious diplomatic mission and strategy across the ASEAN partner nations and in the South Pacific. This is a country that actually does punch above its weight. And when I compare with my native Canada, I, I think there is much that Canada could learn from Australia. And from no. what, for, sorry, uh, and from what you've seen, do we do we we have the desire to engage in this sort of space? But do we have the capabilities to to develop the workforce for um, AUKUS? You've seen the university sector. Where do we get all these people, the, these these experts, these these uh, technicians that are meant to give us this capacity? You know, immigration, I think, into this country needs to needs to expand. Um, uh, and I think the government is taking steps uh, to, to ensure that there's a very wide pipe of skilled labor coming into Australia. We will never, it seems, have enough engineers to meet uh, the collective demand signal, not just across defense industry, but across the entire sort of industri- industry sector. So, so there are real steps that need to be taken there. But, but I think, you know, what's critically important here is... It's the conversation that government needs to have with Australians. They talk about whole of nation. Uh, we talk about whole of government. But there has to be a political courage to really speak truth to power, and, and it's truth to people, uh, around some of the challenges that we are tracking in the region and and how they potentially could adversely impact us all. With, with, with the upside of that message being, um, this is no time to be a spectator. This is no time to be sitting back and kind of watching the world go by. If you're serious about being Australian and if you're serious about this country, this is a time to reflect upon what are you doing? Mm. So whether you're an early career researcher at a group of eight university, is, okay. is your passion something that has a dual use application that could strengthen Australia's national security? If you are a, a Gen Z uh, looking for purpose in your life um, and 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 making a difference, national service. Uh, I mean, I I believe that there is no higher purpose actually than choosing and volunteering to serve your country um, in uniform, and in this case, the Australian Defence Force. But there, that but that conversation has to be had in a very honest, frank, and transparent way between government and 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 all of us. Um, so, so that we can make those decisions for ourselves. And I, my, my sense with AUKUS and DSR and the budget is that we're, we haven't quite got there yet. And It's a fine line, it's, isn't it, though? Yeah, yeah. Between not kind of creating fear and also yeah. uh, we are a pretty cynical bunch as mm-hmm. Australians. So, so, you know, what is all this palaver about? <laughs> Yeah, you know? what's all um, this money about? Yeah, what and yeah. all this money and you know all of the challenges and you know this this goes right back to the earlier point you made I think Paul that you know it, it's 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 a nation building thing but you've actually got to bring everyone with you and I I think that is as much a challenge as dare I say it the bums on seats <laughs> we've always we've had a shortage of engineers for us. I've been in this sector for 22 years and we've continually had a shortage of engineers all over the place. So, And we know we're nearly get, we're getting to crunch time in terms of deliverables with this. 
and there's a pipeline. So it takes takes time to grow these people. And so I just wonder by you highlighting that we need to have the conversation, you obviously think we're not having the conversation. And therefore, again, what is our role as, you know, conveners, thought leaders, public policy people in actually helping government, whomever is in government, to generate that discussion in a safe way where we're not all cynical about it and we actually believe the government when they tell us something? I think we continue to be constructive, positive, to be seen as uh, sincerely offering to support at the strategic level and to bring some real ideas. Uh, and my sense is that some of these ideas need to lead to, to culture change. Uh, and, and you're seeing some of that language in the DSR, for example. We need to help government move away from a sort of process-driven, reduce risk to zero approach to managing capital programs. Uh, we, 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 we need to, you know, I, I heard a minister at, at a round table a couple of weeks ago in Sydney's it, 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 when referring to the Australian Strategic Capability Accelerator, you know, the mm, mm. sort of the, 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 the Australian DARPA that was met, uh, announced recently that uh, we're going to pick winners, uh, shoot the losers and fail fast. Now, that's a great kind of tagline. And we all understand what that kind of means. It's kind of a Silicon Valley approach uh, to uh, um, unleashing innovation and allowing people to run towards risk, knowing that there'll be casualties, but there'll be big winners. And we will, we will, you know, reward everyone, regardless of whether they win or lose. But there's a huge culture change that needs to come with that. And how does, you know, how do we as a tertiary sector provide that sort of social science, evidence-based advice to help make those changes that would enable the machinery of government to be much more agile, forward-leaning, risk-embracing, and output-oriented, such that the when they talk about an enhanced, focused forest for the ADF over the next couple of years, uh, up to 2025, that there's actually things happening in those two years, and it's not just process uh, um you know setting setting things up you know setting things up based on the direction that was in the dsr i mean we we, we, we need to be moving nimble. out a little quick, yeah. more quickly so this is really that. interesting though because you talked earlier to in response to your question ron about you know the differences that you saw coming here and and what a, one of the things that you highlighted was a risk appetite compared yeah. to mm. but actually yeah. we've talked on this podcast it, to many of uh, our researchers and others about the risk appetite not being quite there when it comes to like commercialization and of research, research yeah. etc so i guess it's how do you balance that and it, it's a culture change not just from the people it's also a culture change from the defense forces and government back to us trusting us as universities and researchers i think bringing us into the tent and having an open yeah. and honest conversation with us at least that's how I'm seeing it as I'm sort of coming along this journey myself. I, 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 would, I would like to see universities um, invited into the room more frequently and earlier in the conversation. I, I would really like government to, to view our sector as absolutely critical to almost everything that happens in this country and, and to look for whatever those barriers are to, to that full sort of trust based integrated approach to policy and, and, and problem solving, and then be constantly looking to uh, find ways around those obstacles. So, you know, for example, I, in the defense space, you, you know, I, 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 I remind uh, folks that I meet at senior levels in defense quite frequently that of what I've just said, and, and that, you know, my university in particular, is really keen to lean in as hard as we can uh, to do more, to to help accelerate, to be a catalyst, to bring our extraordinary discovery and innovative capacities to bear. But sometimes you get the impression that uh, folks in Canberra, their 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 bandwidth is so entirely consumed with the tyranny of the urgent. And I understand that. I I've served at that level, that 
you know, universities, and I'm talking, I guess, outside the Department of Education, mm. where you mostly operate, Vicky, I would think. Um, Actually, surprisingly, no. That, <laughs> I tend okay. to operate, well, I'm, yeah, which is which is also interesting because that's the assumption that it's the Department of Education, but it's a such a broader remit that we are covering okay. off now. Mm. Well, okay. well, one so thing my, my, my apology. One thing I'd like to drill down on, though, you you talk about the need to you know speed some of these things up. And looking at your experience in both the military and and uh, the diplomatic area, but also with the centre, what are the most immediate uh, threats that face Australia? And how should we deal with those, given that we've had this document released more recently, the uh, Defence uh, Review? What do you see as some of the, the most fundamental threats that we face that we need to tackle uh, as urgently as possible? We're obviously concerned about the trajectory of the Chinese Communist Party and what is the long-term intent of the CCP leadership in terms of sort of great power contestation. So if you read the you know, if you, if you connect the dots over the past many years, uh, there's clearly a, tra- a, a trajectory which which suggests that Beijing believes the United States is in criminal decline, that it is their sort of natural place as a great rising power to become the preeminent global power and therefore be in a position to reshape, or reorder that rules-based order in, in in a way that would, would run contrary to Australia's fundamental values as a, as a free democracy. So that, that's a concern. Aligned with that is the rapid, unprecedented expansion of the People's Liberation Army in all domains. And, 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 and what is the reason for that? But as it is expanding, it is putting peer capabilities, peer to the United States and, and our allies and partners, uh, peer capabilities into the field, at sea and into the air, into space, undersea, um, in the cyber domain. I mean, we're under constant attack in the cyber domain and that gray zone. So th- these are, this is a threat. And, and, and for us as a island global trading nation that depends so much on a international maritime law enabled freedom of the sea through the Strait of Malacca, through the South China Sea, our undersea digital trade infrastructure, the, the, the fiber cables, all of that, we have to ensure that it is protected, secured, and that we are demonstrating a commitment to deterrence that would cause a potential adversary such as China to uh, pause and f- try to find ways short of conflict to, to resolve some of the concerns they have. So, have, so have we been asleep that, at the wheel? That, that's, have we no. been asleep at the wheel and this has all been happening and then all of a sudden we've woken up and thought, oh, we need to do something here. Suddenly we need, you know, what are the statistics we need? There's a shortfall of 3,000 people within the ADF, you know, all mm. of a sudden. I mean, this couldn't have just happened overnight. No, it hasn't happened mm. overnight. And, and I'm sure if you went back and listened to chiefs of the Defence Force and the chiefs of service, uh, what they were saying publicly over the past 15 years, uh, there would have been, this would have been a fairly uh, clear uh, narrative. But really, up until 2016, 2017, Folks, not just in Australia, but around the world, um, in the United States, in Canada, the UK, Germany, were quite um, uh, quite, quite taken with the prosperity that was mm-hmm. uh, flowing from their trade relationships with a rising power such as China, and and that seemed to trump the those who were openly questioning what was the long-term strategic intent of the Chinese Communist Party. And, and, and that's what I think is, has kind of led us to where we are mm. today. Which means that there's a lot of work for your centre to do and um, the various universities involved in the group of eight over the years ahead and, and, and our government. But Paul Madison, thank you very much for your time today. It's been a most uh, insightful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thanks for your company today. If you'd like more information about the issues raised in this podcast or other related topics, 
please visit our website at geo8.edu.au. And a quick reminder that you can always tune in to Debate at Geo8 on Spotify, Google, Apple or YouTube. Bye for now.